Good morning and happy Easter. Our Lord has risen. We want to welcome you to the Decatur Church of God and are so glad you have taken time to worship with us today. You will find that love gathers here at DCOG. That love is shown through our nursery care for your babies as well as classes for your preschoolers up to age four during the service. You'll find that at the west end of the building. You were given a program as you came in this morning that has activities going on here at DCOG. However, here are some quick highlights happening we don't want you to miss. There is the Jerry Mitchell Wild Game Supper coming up this Thursday evening beginning at 6 p.m. It is for donation only. If you can help set up, have meat you can bring, or want to donate funds, please see Jason Egley or Dion Jordan. We'll see you here, guys. The Purpose Youth are selling Andy's Knockout Chicken for their upcoming trip to San Antonio for the International Youth Convention of the Church of God. The chicken will be available to pick up at the Old Walgreens parking lot on Sunday, May the 1st from 11 to 2 p.m. Please stop by the gathering immediately following the service to support our youth. We want to buy up all the chickens they have available. Thank you so much for your support of our youth ministry. Kids and youth, it's still not too late to sign up for the YCL camps. Dates and times are on the website, and a link will take you to the YCL website. If your child is a regular here at DCOG, we will pay half the fee. Sign up today at the Connect and Grow iPads or on our website, and don't miss out on the fun. There is an all-church golf outing coming up Saturday, May the 21st, beginning at 9.30 a.m. This is an 18-hole best ball tourney, and all food and prizes are included. You may sign up as a team or individually, and we will put you on a team. Sign up at the Connect and Grow iPads or on our website at dcog.org. Both men and women are invited to join the fun. Don't miss out. Again, thank you for joining us this morning. We now draw closer together as we draw closer and worship Jesus. For he is our risen Lord and our reason for gathering and deserves all our praise and glory and honor. Good morning. He is risen. He is risen. I'm going to ask you to stand. Come here.
song. Help me out. Come on, Christian. Sing worthy. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy of our praise. Worthy is the One who has overcome the grave. Let the people dance. Let the people sing. Worthy is the mighty King. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy of our praise. Worthy is the One who has overcome the grave. Let the people dance. Let the people sing. Worthy is the mighty King. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy of our praise. Worthy is the One who has overcome the grave. Let the people dance. Let the people sing. Worthy is the mighty King. Amen. Praise the Lord. Welcome to church this morning, Decatur. How are we? We all right? It is good to be in the house of the Lord this morning, amen, on this wonderful, wonderful Easter morning where we gather to celebrate the risen King, the one who came, the one who lived, the one that gave his life and rose victoriously. As we continue into this worship this morning, let us pray. Father God, this is your day, the day that you have made. You are the one who is and the one who will ever be. And this morning we give you praise and you honor. Lord, may the songs that we sing be an echoing from our heart to you, to the very throne of grace this morning. You are alive. Hallelujah. Lord, give us ears to hear today, eyes to see, and a spirit that is willing to follow in Jesus' name, amen. Put your hands together.
Come on, James. Come on. Come on, Angie. Here we go, Alexis. Here we go. said amen you may be seated there was a time when it seemed that no light was bright enough to drive darkness away traces of light would come and go but sooner or later, it all faded. In the end, darkness always won. But then came the sun, the light of the world. And with him came hope. He wasn't like the others. He thrived in the darkness. In fact, he had a way of turning it into light wherever he went. With his words, he made darkness and death run and hide. But darkness was crafty, and he found a loophole. He tricked people into doing his dirty work for him, and they turned on Jesus. They extinguished the only light that could drive out the darkness. Confused and misled, the people falsely sentenced Jesus to the most gruesome execution of all, death the moment he was crucified, in the middle of the day, darkness fell over the earth. For three hours, the sun went into hiding. It was like darkness was celebrating, no longer afraid of light. It is finished, Jesus said with his dying breath. His work here was done. The light was gone. Perfect record claimed the life of the only perfect person to ever live, and hope died with him. The sun was supposed to outshine the darkness. He was the one who was supposed to change everything, and death claimed his life. But on the third day, everything changed. Light emerged from the tomb. Jesus Christ rose from the dead, and with that, darkness took a hit. The giver of life had come back to life, and with him, he brought hope. He gave to us a way out of the darkness. He took back the power over death. He made a way for us to come back to the Father. Jesus brought death to death and gave life to life.
rejoiced as though heaven had lost. church you may be seated
quiet when we approached the tomb. Days before, there was noise wherever we went. Crowds cheering, sometimes yelling. But now in front of his tomb, just silence. I had gathered all my spices and oils intending to anoint the body. But when I got there, he was gone. Jesus changed my life. Ever since the day that I met him in Galilee, he rescued me. And I followed him ever since, all the way to his death. But there was the tomb, and it was empty. My heart broke into a thousand pieces. I turned, and there was a gardener, and I asked him if he knew where they had taken Jesus' body. But I recognized it was Jesus. It was my Lord. 
He taught us that his sheep would recognize his voice, and I knew him. I knew him the minute he said my name. I dropped to my knees. What else could I do but cling to him? I never wanted to let him out of my sight. But no, he had different plans for me. He wanted me to let the others know about the good news. I ran as fast as my legs would carry me, shouting like an excited child. <laughs> he did it! He did it! He, he really did it! Yes. <laughs> to think that I had come to an anoint a dead man and I left with proof that he is the overcomer of everything. I, all of us, can never beat fear, sorrow, sin, definitely not death. Death. He beat death. Who do I say that he is? I know who he is. Oh, I know who he is. He said that he would rise. And he most certainly is risen. He is the savior. He is, he is the one true God. <laughs> that church. the river into the river 
What a week it's been. We gathered together last week as we celebrated Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. What hope, what optimism, what, what promise was in store for this coming king. And yet, Thursday, Jesus gathers with his disciples in that upper room and he celebrates their last meal together. And even in that moment, there were those that didn't fully understand both what was to take place, but also that extraordinary moment of grace on that Thursday. You know, this week I heard a sentence that stopped me in my tracks, and I had to circle back to it as it related to that last meal together that Jesus had with his disciples as he shared the meal, as he talked about what was coming, as he washed their feet, the simple sentence said this, Judas ate too. Judas ate too. I had to circle back. I thought, you know, in the midst of all the story, right? Growing up in the church, we understand how the story ends with Judas doing a very Judas thing, but it for the first time in my life, I had stopped to pause for a moment to recognize that Judas ate too, even in the midst of that moment. That extension of grace. And then Friday comes, and as we watch in the video, all hope is lost. Where's the parade? Where's the fanfare? Where is this conquering king that was going to overthrow the Roman Empire? And darkness filled the land. And I have to believe the disciples felt the same way that we often feel in the midst of frustration and sadness when we think there is no hope, there is no future, there is no peace, there is no redemption. But Sunday's coming. You see, in the midst of that dark place, in the midst where we thought we had it wrong, God was already orchestrating a plan <coughs> to do the unreasonable, the unthinkable, the miraculous. You see, for us, friends, God has done all of the hard work. It is finished. It was not uttered by me. It was uttered by Jesus because Jesus finished it. And at the moment where Jesus was called out of the tomb, it wasn't the disciples that called him. It was God the Father. Come forth. Be raised to life. If I'm honest with you, there are times in my life where I think that the work of being a follower of Jesus is hard. You have to say hard things and be part of hard conversations. Living in this world is hard as a follower of Jesus, but in this moment, in this morning, in this time of Easter celebration, what I want you to hear from me is that Jesus has already done the hard part. You see, over the last couple of days, we've been getting things ready for our move to Decatur, and so we're, we're hauling away truckloads of junk, we're we're, we're moving tables and chairs, and we're bringing in mulch, and we're cleaning out sheds, and you know, as a good parent, we're trying to work with our kiddos to kind of help them get engaged in the process, and inevitably, they are working as hard as they possibly can. They are slaving away for us. They are, they're putting in the, the work, you know, at least five to seven minutes at a time. Hey, we look and say, well, Papa, I need a break. I'm, I'm tired. And in the back of my mind, what I'm thinking is, you have no idea how much hard work is on the horizon. This is just the beginning. And as we were going through that process yesterday, as I was getting this beautiful sunburn that you see here, the first Easter egg this morning at my house was the unveiling of the sunburn head. I began to think about that, and I began to think about, that's how I feel sometimes as a follower of Jesus, like, like my boys, working hard or hardly working, depends on your definition, right? And saying to God, I'm tired, I'm exhausted, this is so hard. And I envision 
that the Father is looking at me the same way we do with our kids, with love in our eyes and joy in our hearts, as Aurora and I laid our weary heads down and say, man, we are so proud of how hard our kiddos worked this weekend. They didn't squawk and complain, or at least not as much as they normally do. And what joy that filled my heart, and I thought, oh, Father, thank you. Because I think that's what he does when he looks down upon us as children and he sees us working and saying, God, it's hard and the soil is tough and our energy is low. In the back of our mind, the Father is repeating to us the words of Jesus on the cross that day. Don't worry, child. It's finished. There is no more hopelessness. There is no more brokenness. There is only the risen Lord upon whom we trust and in whom we believe. And so I began to ask myself on this Easter Sunday, what what are we going to preach from, right? One of the traditional passages, obviously. And the Lord began to speak to me and say, no, I want to talk about what's next. You see, for us, the miracle of the resurrection is changing for us in this moment, but the question becomes, what happens after Sunday? What happens on Monday? What's expected of me beyond belief? And that, friends, is what we want to process this morning. If you have your Bibles with you, I'd like you to turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. If you have the Bible app on your phone, you can open that bad boy right on up there. Go right to the live events. You'll see the Decatur Church of God. There you'll see our passage as well as our notes. If you want to follow along, save things for later. You can say like this part was boring. Save that for later. You're going to want to know that. God's word says this. Because we understand our fearful responsibility to the Lord, we work hard to persuade others. God knows we are sincere, and I hope you know this too. Are we commending ourselves to you again? No. We are giving you a reason to be proud of us so that you can answer those who brag about having a spectacular ministry rather than having a sincere heart. If it seems we're crazy, it's to bring glory to God. And if we are in our right minds, it is for your benefit. Either way, Christ's love controls us. Since we believe that Christ died for all, we also believe that we have all died to our old life. He died for everyone so that those who receive this new life will no longer live for themselves. Instead, they will live for Christ who died and was raised for them. So we've stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. At one time, we thought Christ merely from a human point of view, how differently we know him now. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone and a new life has begun. And all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ and God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we're Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering of our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. As we think about this Easter morning experience, this resurrected Lord, what I want us to come to recognize is this is the what's next. In light of what you know, in light of what you've experienced, this is the blueprint for what's next. This is how we are to live as followers of Jesus. You may be sitting here this morning and say, well, Brent, I don't believe in Jesus yet. Don't worry. There'll be an opportunity for that. What I want you to hear is what's expected of you in this moment as you're wrestling with that question of the Holy Spirit on your heart. What does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? This is the information I want you to wrestle with. And as we as the church try to be the hands and feet of Jesus where we live, work, and play here in Decatur, I want you to be thinking about these things as well because this defines what your next steps are. This is your Easter too. 
It's not just an opportunity of redemption and reconciliation and hope and peace for those that take a step forward in faith for the first time. It also exists for those within the context of the church who've been walking for years or decades or nearly centuries. As we begin this passage and we begin to kind of peel away the pieces of this, I love the way this translation places verse 13. It says, if it seems we're crazy, it's to bring glory to God. And if we are in our right minds, it is for your benefit. A key thought I want you to think about as we are walking in faith is this. Sometimes following God makes us look crazy. Sometimes following God makes us look crazy. It looks different. Because Jesus preached and taught an upside-down kingdom, right? A kingdom that was normally defined in a, in a worldly, uh, worldly way, a Roman way, about position, power, prestige, money, and influence. Those are the keys to the small K kingdom. But Jesus ushered in a different kind of kingdom, a humble, servant-led kingdom of God, where the first are last and the last are first, where those that normally would sit at the position of authority in the table are pushed to the side and the undesirable are allowed to, to come in and wash his feet with their tears and wipe them dry with their hair. It is a different kind of kingdom. And when we live our lives as followers of Jesus, it ought to look different. It ought to have something that looks different than the world that is around us. And so for us, sometimes, as we extend radical moments of grace, that's an evangelistic moment. It's not always just about sharing the true gospel with our words through a process, though that's important. Sometimes the gospel manifests itself by me not laying on the horn four seconds after the light turns green in the intersection. Maybe for me, looking different is not standing at the Casey's when I've clearly called ahead and I got Tim back there. He's working on a pizza. I don't know if it's my pizza. I'm grumpy. I have places to be. Tim, this is why I ordered ahead. You see, for us, that's the normal response. I'm grumpy. I'm angry. I'm inconvenienced. I'm not happy about the things that are happening. That's the normal response. Oh, it's perfectly reasonable. I see that Brent clearly pre-ordered this pizza, and yet two people went ahead of him? That's outrageous behavior. You see, for us, when we begin to look different and we extend moments of grace, when we grab that server who is working short-staffed in a giant full section and doing her doggondest to serve us well, if we just stop her for a second and say, you're doing a great job today. They say, I don't feel like I'm doing a great job. I mean, I'm running around here like a chicken with my head cut off. And you go, I just want you to know I see you. I see your work. I see your effort. And I appreciate it. You see, that looks different. That's sticky. Those are tangible things, right? I haven't even, I haven't even asked you to get a tract out of your back pocket yet. And we're already sharing the gospel. You see, that's the power of resurrected life is that, is that it changes us fundamentally. And if it doesn't, then that's an us problem, not a God problem. You see, for us, we have to begin this process of refining the way that we see the world. And verse 16 gives us a beautiful example of that. Verse 16 says, we have stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. At one time, we thought of Christ merely from a human point of view. How differently we know him now. Here's another key thought I want you to think about this week. One of the hardest things to do as a follower is to see people through a God-shaped lens and not a human one. Can I say that again for me today? Not for you. None of you need to hear this today. This is for me. One of the hardest things to do as a follower of Jesus is to view others through a God-shaped lens and not a human one. Boy, do I love to look at people through a human lens. One of my favorite activities is to sit in a restaurant and just make up completely fabricated stories about the people at the tables around us. Why? I have no idea. It's probably something to do with me being wrong. But I love it. 
I love to fabricate these stories of who these people are based on the food they order, the clothes they wear, the amount of cranial accessories they have in their face, the storybook that is clearly designed all over their body. Love it. Love those stories. It is awesome. But here's the problem. That's a human lens, right? You judge a book by its cover. They tell you not to do that in your entire life, but guess what? We all do it. Have you ever gone to a bookstore? You're judging all the books by the cover. That's the whole point of an awesome cover, right? To get somebody to go, ooh, that looks interesting. Let me pull that bad boy off. You see, as a follower of Jesus, we have to replace that human lens almost like a surgery, like a, like a LASIK surgery where we come in and we change our vision and all of a sudden we need to begin to look at the world through a Jesus lens, a Jesus lens says to someone like Zacchaeus, a tax collector, the worst of the worst, stealing money from his own people. There's nothing worse than a tax collector, right? IRS, see you on Monday. But in this moment, Jesus walking down the street looks up and says, Zacchaeus, I'm coming to your house today. Not next Tuesday. Not, not in time for you to get yourself cleaned up and your house in order. I'm coming to your house today. As Peter and Andrew are walking on the shores of Galilee, Jesus says, come with me today, and I'm going to make you fishers of men. Today, this is the moment. What about all the things I have to figure out? What about all the things I have to do? Jesus says, don't worry about any of that. None of it matters right now. You're coming with me today in this moment. For me, I'm a bit of an amateur fisherman, not a great fisherman, love to be fishing, not amazing at it. I'm looking forward to some of y'all teaching me how to master it up. I love crappie fish, love crappie fish with a big old giant heart. But what I hate about crappie fishing, once you have this giant cooler of crappie, is that you got to clean them when you get home. You see, for me, the cleaning is never as fun as the catching, the catching is awesome. It's euphoric. It's the, it's, the, it's the bait going in. It's the reeling in. It's the how big is it going to be when it gets up to the shore. That moment is awesome. The arrival home to clean said fish leaves a little bit something to be desired. Wouldn't it be awesome if there were already someone at home to clean the fish? I mean, I did the fun part. Let someone else do the dirty part. The same is true with Jesus. For most of us at our human lens, we want these fish to arrive into the boat clean. How many of you fishermen here have ever cleaned a fish on the way into the boat? Anybody here? Anybody ever cleaned a fish successfully on the way into the boat from the line? Okay, we got honest people at this church. That's what I like to see in here, right? It's impossible. You couldn't possibly do it. It is <laughs> physically impossible to clean a fish on the way. What do you do? You wait until the fish is in the boat. Then you worry about cleaning the fish. What a beautiful story for the church, right? We, we sometimes expect these fish to arrive at church cleaned up. I'd like you to come to church with me Sunday. Well, you know, I got these problems at home. My wife or my husband, you know, we're fighting. We got problems. Maybe we go get some counseling and then we'll come to church. You say to somebody, man, I'd love for you to come be a part of our small group. Well, you know, it's a small group. There's a lot of honesty going on in those groups, and I've got kind of a messy situation going on. I don't think I want to join that group. When I get my life together, I'll join the group. You say, well, man, we're having this great event out at the church, man, on Thursday night. We're going to be cooking up some wild game and eating some food. Awesome, by the way, I'm going to be in town on Thursday, so this is like the best week of my life. I'm going to get to eat the wild game. And they say, well, I go, but that's a church event. I don't know. I might say something wrong. I might wear the wrong outfit. I might say the wrong thing and offend somebody. You see, the, the beautiful thing about being a follower of Jesus is it's the best part of crappie fishing. All we're doing is casting it out. We're just casting it out. We're catching the fish, and we're letting Jesus clean them. We're going to let Jesus clean them. We don't care how messy the fish is when it gets here. We don't care if we hooked it in the jaw and ripped its lips off. We don't care if we're going to get it in the boat and we're going to let Jesus deal with it. That's what it means to switch your lens from a human one to a God one. The God one says, 
I'm going to let God do the hard work, right? That's how we began the service. The, the, the hard work is already done. The debt has already been paid. All we have to do is cast out the line and wait for the fish to just jump on those hooks. As you read through in 18 and 19, we are reminded that everything that's happened is a gift from God who brought himself back through Christ and has given us the task of reconciling those to him. You know, for me, there's power in verse 20. Not only are we reconcilers, we're ones that make things right. That's what reconciliation means, it makes things right. And reconciliation, by the way, is a hallmark of our movement. If there are any of you here that are a little older than me, you might remember one of the most amazing phrases that I learned when I was just a brand new baby into the church of God. I had this old-timey minister come down, and I said, you know, why did you join the church of God? He said, I grew up in the church of God in the early 30s, and he said, this is what drew me. It was one of our old slogans, and I said, well, what slogan is it, you know? He said, a united church for a divided world. And I said, ooh, I like that. That's got to be new, right? That's got to be a new modern thing. That sounds very 2022, doesn't it? And he said, no, that was one of the early, early rallying cries of the Church of God movement. A united church for a divided world. That's what Jesus does. He's the great reconciler. He makes molehills out of mountains. <laughs> the things that seem so chasmic and so vastly different. Jesus straightens those, and he equalizes the world. And because of that, we are called his ambassadors. We are the ones who speak in the name of Jesus. So that brings us to this week's big idea. This week's big idea is this. Each of us has a key role to play in sharing the good news of Jesus with the world around us. This isn't just my job, by the way. I mean, you would be surprised at the number of people that would say to me, well, that's what we pay you for, right? You know, we pay you to be there on Sunday morning. We'll drag them in. You gospel them up, and then we'll all high five in the gathering place after church. But the reality is we all have a role to play. Yes, this room and this moment and this time and space is sacred and designed for that. But guess what? We're outside of these walls a lot more than we're in. So the question I will constantly be asking you is how are you being Jesus in the places that you live, work, and play? How are we becoming a reflection of who Jesus is in this community? Indicator in the places that we live, work, and play. And I'm maybe extra conscious of this because of the fact that I'm coming here as a newbie. I'm like extra, extra, extra nice because I never know that the person that I'm mean to at the gas station or the Walmart, <coughs> they might show up on some Sunday, right? I mean, we talked to each other at Walmart this week, did we not? There it is, you know, small town life. You just look on out there and all of a sudden it's like, well, there's the preacher standing in the clone aisle. wonder what he's up to. Might as well stop and say Hi. Which is awesome because you could have walked away, right? I mean, you could have just pretended you didn't see me. It's a moment where we choose to be Jesus where we live, work, and play. And so the questions that we're going to wrestle with this week are going to define this big idea. They're going to define how we share the gospel. So what are our questions for this week? They're this. Why do you think it's so hard to stop evaluating others from a human point of view? This is a question I wrestle with all the time. This is deep within my heart. This is something that I struggle with because I want things to be right. I want things to be just. And I had someone who was very uh, instrumental in my, <laughs> my faith as a young married man. Uh, he asked me the question. He said, well, Bren, is it more important that you're right or that you have a good relationship? Because sometimes you can't have both. 
And there were times in my life where I was so committed to being right so my wife would see my rightness that I didn't see that I was burning a relationship down the road. And in the midst of that, I was burning trust down that road. And so for me, I had to make a paradigm shift. I just I don't have to always be right. Now, don't get me wrong. You spend more than about seven minutes with me, you're going to realize I love being right. As a matter of fact, I tell Rora, what is it the fact that I'm, uh, I'm always right is a what? It's a curse, right? I hate being right all the time, guys. It's a burden. It's a mantle that I have to carry. I don't wish it on you. And she just does what she did this morning. She just silently shakes her head. She says, but you're not always right. But I feel right. And so I need Jesus speaking into my life and softening that and say, you're not right. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one gets to the Father except through me, not Brent. I don't get a vote. At the end of the age, there won't be a ballot booth where we get to vote yay or nay, and they either go up or down depending upon how we roll those votes. No, there's a moment where we have to be susceptible to the Spirit of God to say, Lord, help me. Help me love well even when it's hard. And if 2022 has taught us anything, well, heck, if 2020 through 2022 has taught us anything, (coughs) it's it's hard to love. It's hard to love people. It's hard. And that's why I tell folks following and trusting in Jesus is the easiest thing in the world, but it's the hardest job you'll ever have. It's intrinsically easy. It's easy to love, by the way. We do it as children um, unbelievably well. I spent about two hours with, uh, with a friend's daughter that I actually hadn't got to meet yet. She was two. Do you know how many hugs and high fives I got from her? She'd never seen me a day in my life. All day long, every time moving out of the moving truck, high five. Let me give you a hug. Bye, Brent. We learn it intrinsically. But the older we get, the more cynical we get, the more the darkness creeps in, and it's harder to see through that prism of love because we have to be right. And the reality is we're going to get them into the boat. We're going to let the Lord work on them, right? We're all broken. I have stuff I need to have worked on. I don't just get to pretend it isn't there, right? We don't just pretend sin doesn't exist. It does. That's why Jesus had to come. But it means this, that we're all a work in progress, and as ambassadors of Christ, we speak with the authority of Jesus. So the second question is this, what does it mean to be a new creation for you today? What does it mean for you to be a new creation? This is both for someone who might be asking about God for the first time today and somebody that's been walking faithfully for generations. What does it mean to be a new creation for you? What does it mean that the sun rose on you today differently than yesterday? And third, it's the most important question. Who is Jesus to me? Who is Jesus to me? Paul's writing this book to the Corinthian church to encourage them in their faith and to remind them that there is a job that has to be done. And that Jesus Christ, who never sinned, became sin for us. Think about that for a moment. Have you ever been wrongly accused of something? Ever in your life one time, have you ever been wrongly accused of something? Ooh, doesn't that eat at you? You hate it, right? To know you did right, and yet you're being accused of it. Now think about this. That's exactly what Jesus did. He became and bore the sin that you and I earned. Those were our stripes. That was our cross. These are our choices. And yet, Jesus chose to lay down his life that we might be reconciled to the Father. That's the good news of the gospel, friends, is this, that God loves you so much today that he made it possible for you to come to him, not through an altar of sacrifices, not through the upholding of 670-some-odd Old Testament laws, 
not by being good enough, smart enough, and doggone it, people liking you. He made it possible by belief in the one who came, the one who lived a sinless life, became life for all of us so that no longer would there be separation. No longer did a person like me have to go into the Holy of Holies and pray on your behalf. You now had unfiltered access to the Father. That is the good news. The good news is when we open up our eyes to the stars around us at night, as we feel the sea mist on our skin on the oceans of the world, when we hear the splash of a bobber in a lake creek, that God, that creator, that redeemer, that way maker, that is the one who came for you to love you more than you could even love yourself. To me, that's good news. People ask me all the time, how can you believe in Jesus? How, how in the world can you go about this process where you think that being a Christian is good news? And I say, because God loves me. God made a way for me. You see, I'm a different person now than I was. And Lord willing, I'll be a different person next year than I am today. Because that's what faith looks like. It's not about being sinless, as I was told by a Sunday school teacher long ago. It's about trying to sin less. <laughs> It's not about perfection. That isn't the gold standard. Faith is the gold standard. Trust is the gold standard. So here's my question. I'm popping. I don't know. Is it my stubble? Maybe the batteries. Sorry. Here's, here's our next step. I want you to choose life today. Choose life. For the first time, maybe as you're sitting here, I want you to, to ask yourself, do I trust him? Do I follow him? Just a few moments as we close this service, I'm going to give you an opportunity to respond in faith. So maybe your next step today is just choosing Christ, just choosing this way, saying, I don't know all the answers, I don't know where it's going to lead me, but today, I'm going to try it out. I'm going to try it and see if it works for me. Maybe today your next step isn't trusting Jesus <coughs> for the first time, it's making a new commitment to being an ambassador of Christ where you live, work, and play. You see, today is your Easter too. Easter isn't just about new life and new faith, although it is about those things. It's also about a redemptive moment in the life of every follower of Jesus that gets to choose this moment to upgrade your passport. The passport of faith, it's time to get it out. It's time to put a new picture on it. It's time to put a few new stamps on those pages because God has work for you in Decatur. You may say, well, preacher, this is a small town. We got a lot of churches. Probably nobody even here knows, doesn't know Jesus yet. We know that statistically only about 35 to 40 percent of this community is fully engaged in a gospel-changing life experience with Jesus. So, y'all, we got some work to do around here. How can we be the hands and feet of Jesus where we live, work, and play? In just a moment, I'm going to pray. And if you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus, what I want to say to you is this. Can you trust him today? I'm going to pray a really simple prayer. There's nothing magical about the prayer. In fact, the prayer doesn't save you. It's your decision to follow that does. But I'm going to pray the prayer anyway because I figure it's a whole lot easier than you just trying to figure it out yourself. And then I'm going to pray for our church and pray that God will do a mighty work as he has already done through our first service and now our second service. Choose life today because Jesus chose life for you today. Let's pray. Father God, you are so good. And we are so abundantly thankful for who you are. And we recognize, God, we don't always have the answers. We recognize, God, that sometimes we look foolish and misguided. But we also recognize, God, that you have called us to more. And so, Father, there may be some folks that are here today that don't trust in you as their Lord and Savior. 
And Father, we don't want them to leave this space, this time, without having a chance to respond. So if you're hearing my voice and you're, you're feeling that little tug and you say, I do, man, I want to know Christ. I want him to be in my life. I want to follow him. I'm just going to ask you to just quietly in your heart repeat these things after me. Dear God, I need you. God, I know that I have messed up. I know that I've chosen to be selfish at times. And that selfishness is a sin. Jesus, would you forgive me of my sin? Jesus, would you wash me clean and new? And Jesus, would you help me to see the world as you see it? Today, I give you my life. Today, I give you this day. Today, I give you all the days of my life. With every head bowed and eyes closed, if you prayed that prayer this morning, I just let just peek your little hand up there and just say, man, I did it today. Today was my day. If that's you and the Lord has led that on your heart, I just, just throw that up. That's totally fine. Yeah. Father, for those of us that are in this room that continue this journey, would you give us strength? The psalmist reminds us that we will rise up as if upon eagle's wings. Lord, we need you to ride through this community with a fresh faith and fire. And may we be the flame keepers. I pray for our church today. In this new season of life and in this new season of ministry, Lord, we need you. We need you to be with us, alongside of us, and most importantly, going ahead of us. Lord, thank you for Easter. Thank you for the gift of Jesus, for the sacrifice he made, and for the life he brings. In Jesus' name, amen. The cross has a fine word. The cross has a fine word. Sorrow may come in the darkest night, but the cross has a fine word. Sing. The cross has a fine word. The cross has a fine word. People may put up the strongest fight, but the cross has a fine word.
That is a teaser for our new, brand new sermon series that starts next week, Following the Way, The Simple Path of Jesus, where we're going to put into your hands some really specific skills and things that you can employ in your life to be a faithful, effective follower of Jesus. Friends, it's been an amazing Sunday morning at church today. I'm sure you all noticed all the beautiful flowers and the gathering place and out in the narthex. And man, we just want to say a special thanks to Sue and her team who worked tirelessly yesterday. Let's give them a round of applause to kind of get everything going. Absolutely. Um, hopefully you've taken some time, not during the sermon, I hope, but sometime before that to go through that in memoriam insert to kind of see where those were. If you uh, uh, gave one of those uh, memorials today, please make sure you pick up your plant on the way out. Anything in foil is for you. Um, one other thing I just want to mention as we go, um, we only have two weeks left for knockout chicken, Right? So I want you to get over there, see Bo, get your tickets for the knockout chicken. We got this weekend and next weekend. Um, as a matter of fact, I think I'm going to go stand over there in the corner, so I'm just going to make you go over there, even if it hadn't been your plan. There we go. Thank you, James. Appreciate you on the back. Awesome. It's going to be a wonderful time, uh, and then I'll look forward to seeing you all on Thursday night here as we get ready to cook up some game, right? Yeah. Wild game. Wild. There's mystery meat, even. Dude. Mystery yeah. meat. I mean, I don't know. Those are magical words to me. Mystery meat. All right, friends, as we go forth from this place, I want to give you the simple benediction. May the God of grace and peace who loves you faithfully walk with you always. May you reach out and touch his hand. May you listen intently to hear his voice. And may you walk faithfully in his steps. This week, be blessed, friends. Walk in his goodness and mercy this day and all the days of your life. You are dismissed. Have an awesome Easter Sunday. Worthy is the Lamb, worthy of a praise. Worthy is the one who has overcome the grave. Let the people dance, let the people sing. Worthy.